My name is Dave Pauley and I'm the Senior Director for Wildlife Response for the Humane Society of the United States. So I technically travel around the country and sometimes the globe catching critters. So I've had exposure to most of these devices. Um, I owned a wildlife damage control business in Madison, Wisconsin called Humane Animal Controls Inc. And did some predator control work and lots of raccoon work. So I know these devices pretty well. I'm going to do a demo of the three capture devices. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, dog safety, how to remove pets from traps, a little bit about uh, first aid, immediate first aid. But I'm going to make a couple overlapping statements. There was the question about tags. Um, traps, most traps are required to have tags on, but they don't require that the tags are readable. Uh, one of these traps, I mean, they, they, there are copper tags and they wrap them around the chain, so they're hidden so that if a game enforcement agent, a warden, finds him, he can find out who, but if you were to look for it, you would be disturbing the trap and that would be illegal. Yeah. So it's kind of a catch-22. There is ID on most of them, but it's hard to find. Um, one of the other key things is, uh, you know, these traps are, are designed for commercial take of fur, but most states, every state in the United States, uh, banned set guns for taking animals for a long time. I mean, 50 years ago, set guns became illegal because they were indiscriminate. Um, they, they could cause injury or death to a human or an animal. And yet, we haven't progressed much on some of these devices from that time. So it's just a kind of an overbearing thought to think about. Um, your biology question we could spend a day and a half on, on population control, but we may touch on that a little bit. And then I'm going to do the demo stuff first. So I'm going to start with snares. We don't have many snares this size. This is actually a bear snare. But if, uh, if snares um, for wolves become popular, if they can start snaring wolves, you're going to see devices like this. This one's got a little kink in it. But you'll be able to see that basically you've got a, a piece of cable and a locking mechanism that, that slides down and locks. And these can be one main problem with snares are they're relatively inexpensive and they can be homemade. So these devices could be out in the field and there may not be a big incentive to bring them in. I've got some, uh, this one, I'm going to show you another one set up here in a second. Um, but you can see this is actually an Aldridge foot snare so it's designed to be set and cap cap captured by the foot. But most snares are neck devices and the ones that we see in Montana right now are mainly fox and coyote snares like this. This size, a little bigger diameter for coyotes and diameter cable and you're going to see larger snares if a wolf season is open. So just like in the photograph, snares basically are set in a trail so you have some type of locking suspending mechanism and then you have a snare and the snare is set Though all those photographs that we saw were coyote snares, you can tell that from the distance between the ground and the, uh, and the bottom of the snare. So this snare technically would be set up like this. And then depending upon if this is the ground, a raccoon snare would be lower and this would be smaller. If it's a coyote snare, it's going to be higher. Generally speaking, the higher the snare, the bigger the problem with non-targets because a deer or a livestock could get set. But the real detriment of these is low cost and the fact that they hang out there forever. So if there's a snowstorm, they'll still work. There's not a lot of incentive to go get them. And so they will catch things the whole time they're out there. Um, uh, of course, the, they're designed to, to choke, to restrain. The, the only good thing about that with most dogs that are least trained, uh, when they hit the end of a snare, they will sometimes stop and not do the, the last leap that will choke them down. Uh, we're going to talk about removal as a separate thing, but basically these snares can be backed up. But I'll show you a demonstration with dog hair that makes that very difficult. But that's a cable snare. There are literally thousands of them out there in the landscape in Montana. Then I'm showing you three quick different types of foothold traps and three different types of anchoring devices because if your dog is caught and you're trying to get the animal to the vet, um, that's probably the hardest part is getting the trap 
either out of the ground or away from the anchor. So this is a pretty standard little foothold trap, leg hold trap. Um, they are set up all pretty much the same, same mechanism so that they get an animal to step on this little pan and when they step on the pan the jaws come up and spring the trap. And so that's why it's called a foothold trap. You saw in the slide presentation different methods of anchoring can really decrease um, the type of injuries that are done. And all the, the big threat on the horizon now is that they're talking about wolf trapping season. They have it in Idaho right now. They're talking about it in Montana. They're talking about it in Wisconsin. But wolf traps, wolf traps have a much larger jaw spread. They're up higher and other animals can get there. A raccoon that gets caught in a wolf trap will reach under and chew off their foot. Um, very common bec because the circulation is decreased and they can get under there and do that. So those larger traps are more of a threat to dogs and non-targets. This is a foothold trap. It's got a chain and grapple. This grapple would be buried in the dirt underneath. This is really used a lot in eastern Montana in the desert. The animal gets caught, he pops this out of the ground, he pulls this out, and he leaves the trap site, and they have to find him tangled in the brush away. The, the theory of this is that, I'm jumping around a little bit, but the theory is that a, a short stake trap like this, when an animal gets caught and pulls, his foot could pop out. They could pop their foot out. With a chain and grapple, they drag the trap with them and the foot sets up. The swelling takes place under the jaw. So all these devices, um, there is no rule of thumb for how long your dog or cat could be in this trap without getting a substantial injury. Birds, raptors, uh, waterfowl, um, a lot of birds are released from these traps because there's not visual physical damage. But those legs in most wildlife rehab centers will tell you that the damage has been done and the bird's going to lose that leg eventually because circulation's been cut off too long on a bird. Um, and a lot of birds do get caught in these traps. We saw a lot of slides and uh, in Wisconsin, uh, they passed an exposed bait ban that you could not set a trap within 50 feet of any exposed bait. And that really helped decrease, um, decrease the number of non-targets taken. But for whatever reason, and for whatever reason, trapping, the trapping industry and trapping associations have taken the slippery slope approach and are doing no self-regulation. They fight every common sense change. And I, I tell you that from experience because I was on the Trappers Advisory Committee in 1999 and revisited again in 2004. And common sense things like a trap check law, like, uh, well, a half a dozen good recommendations, are fought because they just don't want to give up anything. And again, you saw the numbers, it's a very small percentage. So we had snares and you have a whole different variety of foothold traps. Um, the only benefit of these traps is that most of us, when we see this with our dog in it, can figure out that these things got to go down. I mean, um, uh, getting them to go down, we'll talk about during the release portion, and it's not all that easy, especially if an animal's moving. But at least this is not, take, doesn't take rocket science to figure out. We get to the next category that Casey already talked about and their body grip traps. This is a muskrat size, sometimes called a 110. Um, but it's a little bit different of a technique. It's a little rested up. I'm going to set it on the interior one. But not that, not that dissimilar from, um, you know, a rat trap. Uh, and this is really where the design came from. They're called the Conibear trap from Frank Conibear from Canada, who worked on this. But the animal goes through. Now the interesting thing, you can see the, uh, the trigger is on one side of the trap. So if a trapper sets this, this larger size for a dog, this direction, it's a huge difference than if he sets it this direction for, the, for whether or not the dog dies quickly or slowly because these jaws are going to hit. And I'll demonstrate this and give you a much clearer thing. But um, these traps are designed for muskrats underwater. But 
this is where we really, it really gets kind of crazy and insane, is that these types of devices are out there. This is not my trap in my collection. I haven't set it, so I don't know how touchy it's going to be. But I'll show you two things. These traps, these springs were pre-compressed, and they've got the safeties on them. So the trigger goes down, the trap is set. Yeah, it's stiff. Get that little guy out of the way. And now, this trap is commonly sent for many small species. So I'll take the springs off. This one's going to be hard to do, I can tell already, okay. And so if that were set for a pine marten or a weasel or a raccoon, they would pass through the trap and the trap, again, this is a pretty good example because that is not an instant killing headshot. That is a, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that also, but that is the whole technique. Now, any, I have been fortunate or unfortunate enough to have found a half a dozen live animals in these traps because I'm in the field so much. And I'll talk about that in removing a dog, um, but it's very difficult. I mean, you have to, uh, this next demonstration will kind of give you an idea because this is, this is an unsprung conibear trap. And this is the common tool that they use to set the springs and because some people can compress these by hand, but it's very difficult. And so this device you can get on there. And we're going to show you a better way to do this, but so we get one spring set. Get the second spring set. You can see there's a lot, a lot of torque. This is spring steel. So we have this trap. You can see, I'm hoping you can visualize that it's kind of a Rubik's Cube of piece of equipment. Very difficult to, to figure out when it's set. Now, I'm going to do it. There's two settings in this. I'm going to do it on the lighter setting. Take the springs off. Now again, this trap could be set on the ground for a species. There are devices that get it off the ground so it can be higher. But for this demonstration, it's sprung. I'm going to leave it down. Uh, I'm doing this with full authority of my daughter um, because there's really no other way to demonstrate this than to show that if an animal, sorry little guy, if an animal is going and hits those springs, uh, that is what happens. Now, there's a lot of variability. Um, you know, I've done this many times with this particular dog and caught the nose way up here. Um, but I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you that if you're walking your dog and you hear this noise, you'll hear other noises, you'll hear body noises, you'll hear whining, and this dog is going to be flopping. I mean, it's, uh, it's not going to be a pretty sight. And, and the main thing, the first rule in, in doing this is that you have to remain calm. I know it seems impossible. Um, but it's very important. You're most likely not going to have a device like this. We're going to talk about the snare cutters and all the different tools that you use. But this thing is so bizarre, anybody who sees it for the first time is not going to figure it out. I mean, you're not going to intrinsically look at this and go, well, I have to pull these two things together and then how do I do it? You can't. So hopefully, Everybody who's out walking their dogs will have a couple of devices along and this is probably the simplest. I hope you all have one of these. So the way to spring this trap, and again you have to do it two times, is to step in the beginning of the, in the hole of the leash, 
get close to the dog, put the leash through one spring, back through, back through again, and now it's going to turn the other way and compress the springs by pulling up. Yeah, trust me, this looks a lot easier than it is, and you have to be able to hold that, and you have to be able to get this safety on, which you can see is not coming on real easy. Okay, I got one spring. Now, the dog should be getting some, this side is weaker, the dog should be getting some air and you're probably going to hear some breathing, but you have to get this off, flip the trap over, and do that one more time. And you guys will all get a chance to practice this. But it's much easier to do. And I have done this a few hundred times, so I guarantee you it looks easier than it is. And even with this, this is pretty tight, but that spring does not want to. The good thing is now though, with one sprung, the dog could fall out of there. You could get your dog out, except for see the hair is caught. I let go too. Here, good boy. Okay. And now, okay. So now we've got to cover two other quick things. One is what I just did in the field is technically illegal because, because that dog technically is the property of whoever owns this. Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and ladies, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is unlikely to cite you for removing your dog from a trap. If you get out the bolt cutters and have a party right then and destroy that or seek and destroy every other one in the countryside, then they're probably going to get in trouble. But common sense should dictate that if we're going to a fishing site, uh, a trail, we expect that when we're hiking, our dogs may get exposed to a porcupine. Um, they may run, you know, we may hit a bear and, and deal with that whole thing. But we should have a reasonable expectation that we can take our dogs on a trail and return to the car with them alive from some foreign device that's out there for some, some commercial purpose. I will say if you practice this method, you can do it fairly well. But it's a whole different psyche when it's, you know, I've got a Newfoundland and a wire-haired something or another. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm a very composed guy, pretty, pretty bomb-proof, but I would be freaking out with one of them in there. So that's the whole dynamic. Let's, let's do the first aid thing real quickly just to kind of talk about that, and then I'll, I'll jump around. But um, truly, depending upon the device, um, don't base your decisions on pet first aid based upon what I say today because there's so many variables. It depends upon a lot, the tool, the device, how it was set, you know, whether the dog came at it from which side of the spring, whether it's a nose catch or a neck catch, and a lot depends upon the dog. So um, rule number one, other than you not panicking, is try to calm the dog down. So, because, because, um, we, shock is really our main enemy, and we'll talk a little bit about shock, but the two ways to do that, if there's two of you, the owner of the dog should not be the one to leave. Send the other person to the car, to the phone, to whatever. The owner should stay with the dog to try to calm it down. And calming it down can be as simple as, you know, talking nicely and covering the head. Um, it can be as, um, you know, another head cover is to use your sleeve and grab and then just telescope so you have a head cover so they can still breathe. Talk to the dog, try to calm the dog down, it's okay. Um, and then get the device off. And each device is going to be different because you're going to hate me. Because if he's caught in there, this whole aircraft cable thing is designed that the fur catches the cable. And so as he tightens, the door closed, as he tightens, um, it gets locked up in that fur. And, and the trappers and the pamphlet tell you to get your fingers in here and back it off. It's not as easy said as done, okay? So the first thing you want to do, and I want to try, well, this is a good demo, I guess. Here. Yeah, everybody's got one of these. They seldom work. This happens to be a pretty good one, but I don't know if it will cut it or not. So we're going to go high so I can cut it again. 
Well, it cut into it a little bit. It didn't do it. Now you'll have to try our cutter. Yeah, I will. I will. I'm going to try. But I mean, see, it got bound up. Actually, excuse me, buddy. <laughs> it got bound up. Oh, there's Leatherman here. Okay. We're going to get another candidate. I think it actually just trashed my Leatherman because it's because <laughs> it's uh, it's hung up. So but the, a sh oh, a short-haired dog is going to be easier to back up for yeah. sure, but a long-haired dog. I'm going to leave that on for right now. I'm going to try his. Oh yeah. So again, we're trying a little bit further down. Well, it bit, but it didn't do it. So I got one right here for you. I'll do it. So I mean, anybody's carrying a fencing players should work. Uh, there you can hear it cut, but it didn't break. But it pretty, did a pretty good job, so fencing players. And here is the little cable cutter that they have. And this is nice and small. Spring action. So, we got another, oh, that's a nice one I can tell already. Because it's a spilling senior orange. So see, you can just tell the huge difference between a cable cutter and any other device. Both, both these cable cutters did a pretty nice job. But that's your first thing, is get it away from the anchor, and that will take some of the pressure off, and then try to get under there and back this off. Because it's very difficult, especially with these, to find through that fur and find the cable and cut it. So at this point, you're trying to back it off, and these things will back off if you can find, you, know, you might have to do a little hair removal. It's designed to be, a, it's basically a one-way valve. It'll go this way, but it won't go back with pressure. So you just take the pressure off and push it back. And again, here's that visual on the big model that rides this way, and it'll go. You can, you can back it up. I mean, it's not one way, but when it goes this way, it doesn't go back. So when there's pressure on it, it won't back up, but when you release it, it should back up. So we've calmed the dog down. Now shock, what shock really does is causes the animal to, to heat its core. So it's bringing in blood from its extremities and it's, it's just trying to keep um, itself, um, to take care of all of its vital organs. So we definitely want to keep the dog warm. So coat, jacket, whatever, get that on the dog, um, get him to transport. We probably got a head cover on him. And that's, that's really about that is the first aid for the snares. With the foothold traps, again, if there's, a, if there's a lot of pad damage, if the dog's been in any time or he's been fighting it and rubbing, sometimes you're better off to transport without taking the trap off and take them to the vet. Because if you take the trap off, you could have very severe bleeding. And so then you can try to stop the blood. Um, you know, you can't really put a tourniquet on a dog until you've talked to your vet on the phone because you could be just making things worse. And that is the first rule of first aid, of course. Don't make anything worse than it is. So depending upon, most of the time with a foothold trap, the pad is in there and there's no circulation below the foot and this part is numb. When you first open that up with a dog in the field, that's when he feels pain. And even this little, not this little guy, your little guy, could turn and bite you then because up until you've opened that trap, things have been numb and now you've, all the only thing that's happened is you touched the trap. So you want definitely a head cover before you do anything like that and look to see if there's any damage. And if there's not any damage, I would probably take it off knowing that the dog's going to react. But that's the other first aid. The body grip traps, I, there's just so many things that can go wrong. There's so many different types. The main thing is breathing. You know, you got to get the dog breathing. And um, if, uh, and, the, and the way, I mean, there's nothing, you certainly can do mouth to nose and get some air into the lungs. Um, but you want to see, you want the dog lateral and you want it to be watching for chest compressions. And um, I mean, that has saved some dog's life, that you can put air into their lungs through their nose. If you get the chest to raise, you got some pretty good stuff going and it should take off. But the key thing with these traps is just rapid transport. Um, uh, and then the, the other first aid thing with all of these devices 
is just because you get the dog out of it and just because you're going down the road doesn't mean the animal's okay. I mean, mandatory vet visit, you know. Get them there, especially foothold traps. These devices can cause some real subdermal bruising and, and damages that you won't see. So, you know, your dog should tell you by limping and licking and everything else that there's a problem, but uh, the vet visit, the x-rays are really key. What about those big old bear traps? Yeah, well, uh, the question was, what about those big old bear traps? Um, there shouldn't be too many of those out there, um, since there is no bear season for trapping in Montana. Um, but with the wolf potential, we could, I mean, they're, they're not putting a size limit on the type of trap. Same thing with tooth traps. Um, you're not supposed to see any tooth traps out there, which were the old beaver traps. Um, but there are, and we can get into trap design, there are laminated jaws and round jaws and offset jaws. Um, there's a number of things they do that make them that make them, depending upon your perspective, are supposed to allow blood flow. And generally blood flow means that you don't get the, they're, do, they're designing them so that there's not twist off or ring off, that they're not getting animals to pull out. Um, the good thing on a dog is it probably does help, um, even though the pain may be more intense for that short period of time. If we're hiking with a dog, I'd rather have some circulation.